It's my pleasure to welcome everybody. I have to say I'm in awe of United Way for having brought this important conversation to so many people. We have several hundred people in this audience today. So clearly this is a topic of great importance and of interest to all of us. I am no longer a working mother. I used to be, but I'm now a working grandmother. And I have a sense of what is going on in this country right now that is uh, critical to making sure that working women are treated equitably and fairly in, in the workplace. So let me uh, explain the, the information behind what we're sharing today. Every two years, United Way conducts uh, some very robust research called the ALICE Report. And uh, let me define ALICE for you. ALICE is uh, for, ALICE stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained and Employed People. And when you hear this, it sounds a little bit like a, a mouthful, but the fact of the matter is when you think about it, you are going to realize that you have friends and neighbors who actually are Alice. These are people who are working in one, two, sometimes more typically low paying jobs like cashiers and clerks and healthcare workers and, and grocery store workers. They are the people who are essential to all of our lives, but they can't afford the essentials in their life. And when you look at these numbers, um, it's sort of astounding. This is Maryland. This is the state with the third highest education level in the United States of America. But look at these numbers. 39% of all Maryland households are Alice households and nearly three quarters of single working moms are at or below the Alice threshold. And that number doesn't account for what we've been through in the last several months in terms of the pandemic. So this research, this information is extraordinarily important to corporate America, to not-for-profits and to those people who are making policy decisions in, in government and, and beyond. Um, in fact, I, I understand a guest today who is in the audience is somebody who's had a lot to do with making sure good legislation was passed, important legislation was passed on behalf of women, uh, notably the Lilly Ledbetter Act and uh, Senator Mikulski, we are thrilled to have you in the audience today. You should probably be running this, not I, to tell you the truth. But let me thank all of those uh, corporate partners who make the Alice Report possible and, and make sure that all of us have that information as, as we make decisions going forward. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, as you, um, as you think about this, I want you to think about, and I'm gonna ask you, in a moment to let me know, who are the women that you think are most impacted um, by all of this? But before that, I, let me introduce today's panelists. Uh, all three of them really view this issue um, from a different perch, if you will. Franklin Baker, who is the president and chief executive of United Way of Central Maryland, certainly in the trenches. Natalie Gillard, who I've only recently met and whose work is really fundamental to exploring the issues of, of equity. And she is the founder of Factuality. And Sherry Perkins, um, who, who's got an extraordinary job. And um, she is, is the president of a huge healthcare system, Luminous. She's got 5,000 employees. And if you think about it, we depend on those 5,000 people to work 24 seven to make sure that we're healthy. So as you think about the panelists, as you think about your world, as you think about the world we are in today, um, who do you think is impacted by, which women do you think are most impacted by the issues that are facing working women uh, during this pandemic?
moms of school age children absolutely how i mean how single moms caretakers you know women are caretakers if it's if it's not your kids it's your parents it's your grandparents it's all of the above essential workers i think that we nurses um people there on on the front lines daycare workers all of these people again many of them are people we know people we live next door to people we see all the time um franklin i'm gonna punt to you as we as we hear from the audience on uh the women that they think are most directly affected united way is out there on the front lines so talk to us a little bit about what you've seen in terms of who's been impacted by the pandemic let me start sandy by saying that the pandemic has worsened the inequities that we always knew existed, right? Um, natural and other disasters have always affected Alice households the most, in fact. They have minimal job security. Um, they have little or no savings. So low wage earners, especially women, right? Feel the impact of an economic disruption almost immediately. So hourly workers lost their wages right away as many of us saw and low wage jobs account for the largest number of jobs in Maryland. More than a third of all jobs here in Maryland are hourly positions. And half of these pay less than $20 an hour. So with no financial cushion, no nest egg, no emergency fund, Alice workers are struggling even harder to deal with the consequences of the pandemic. And so think about the women who lost their jobs or had their hours cut back when COVID hit. Many of those women were forced to choose between caring for their children and families or work. Even a single day's worth of lost wages can take a huge toll, not to mention weeks and months, right? And then there are women who are essential workers, as you said. While it's a good thing they are still having their jobs intact, there's the increased risk of exposure to the virus, of course. And the majority of these women don't actually have the luxury of working from home. Because if you work in a grocery store or you work in a restaurant or for delivery service or pro provide, say, essential health care to patients, you can't do that remotely, right? So I believe that the group that has, has really suffered the most devastating consequences in the pandemic and sure to linger long after it's over is low-income working women, for sure. And you know, Franklin, as you talk about that, and as you mentioned uh, hourly wages and the, the $20 an hour wage that still doesn't allow these women to live uh, the life that they need to live and, and the life their families need to live. And we're looking at passing legislation in various places around the country and maybe federally about a $15 an hour minimum wage. So um, as, as we listen to all this, I think each of us has, has to think, what would that mean to us were we in that situation? And Natalie, I know this is something that you've been studying for you know, a very long time, um, structural inequities and biases. Give some definition to us of all of that and how that is playing into the, the current circumstances you see it. Sure, so happy to be with everyone today. I, I love to tell the truth. I, I love that there's truth always embedded into fact sharing. And so I wanna open up with talking about some of the facts. And so in accordance with CBS News, nearly 3 million American women have left the labor force over the past year in what they're calling a coronavirus induced exodus that reflects persistent pay inequality, undervalued work and antiquated notions of caregiving. And so I did see in the comments for audience participation that us, all of us, so it's unfortunate that one, all women are so much more significantly impacted because of this added layer of COVID. But I also noticed in the comments that there were a few participants who referenced minority women or women of color. And I think it's really important that for any time we have this conversation that it is approached through an intersectional lens because it is really important to tease out this fact, the reality that women of color are more significantly impacted and that's even pre-COVID. And so it's, I also saw in the comments that someone mentioned domestic violence. And so we have more women in the household and then we're also seeing that there's this added layer of, of fear presenting. And so going back to the facts, I just wanna read a couple of headlines just to really 
put into, into context how much more impactful the, that COVID has had or the impact that COVID has had on women. And so the headline for CBS was nearly 3 million US women have dropped out of the labor force in the past year. That's referring to all women. But when you take a look at some additional headlines circulating, you'll see that it says COVID-19 job market wreaks havoc on black women laid off more, hired less, Black workers in the COVID-19, the economic fallout of the coronavirus for people of color, Black and Hispanic women aren't sharing in the job market recovery, what coronavirus job losses reveal about racism in America, COVID-19 widens disparities for Black, Indigenous, and other workers of color, so BIPOC. Two more, diverse employees are struggling the most during COVID-19. Here's how companies can respond how COVID-19 has disproportionately affected the mental health of women and BIPOC workers. And so I think that really grounds us in the understanding that while we have all been impacted, it's important to note that some of us are disproportionately impacted and has a lot to do with pre-existing circumstances, the ones that existed prior to COVID. Thank you. Well, COVID has certainly changed the world for all of us. And uh, Sherry, I'm sure it has. It has rattled your world maybe even more than most. And uh, I'm sure that you have a fairly significant BIPOC population uh, working within your 5,000 person workforce. Talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing because um, yours is not just research driven or you are, you are really on the ground seeing this uh, on a daily basis. Well, thank you, Sandy, and uh, very consistent with what Natalie and Franklin have already mentioned. Much of what we're experiencing is pre-pandemic, but let, let me remind you, though, of the timeline of the pandemic, just very briefly. In Maryland, we saw our first patients with COVID-19 in March of 2020, and then think about what we all have experienced in these last 18, 19 months. Um, in healthcare, we learned care. We were faced with um, serious uh, equipment and protective equipment shortages. We've had three major surges. We've been pressed for hospital beds. We've seen increased demand in our community for mental health services because of the concerns of COVID beyond the medical needs. And we've seen a real uptick in violence against healthcare workers. So it's been a very, very significant event, broader than the impact of caring for patients with COVID. Now, optimistically, we then um, got the gift of vaccination, which we're so hopeful about. Like many other infrastructure industry, we have to serve 24 seven to fulfill our mission. And we've been adamant about keeping hospitals across the industry safe and providing care for our communities. Unfortunately, when I think about the impact and, and who I see the impact in, it's in women in healthcare. We've seen a significant COVID burnout and fatigue among the entire healthcare work, um, workforce. What many folks don't know is that 80% of our workers in healthcare are women. And that's often not understood is how reliant, and it was very interesting to see your responses, how reliant we are in healthcare on women, on moms, on single moms. That is 80% of this team. But we have had longstanding concerns, structural issues in healthcare work with 20% uh, turnover year over year. I'll, I'll mention nursing, I'm a nurse. And I've seen this concern across my career, often uh, a third to a half of a workforce in a hospital is nursing. And we've seen these critical shortages throughout my career. We also have many other clinical professional and support pr pr um, positions that require on-site work that are female dominant. And some of our positions such as environmental services and food and nutrition services have ex extraordinarily high turnover and challenges. I'll end um, this piece with um, many, many of our teammates meet the ALICE definition. I'm very inspired by the United Way's work um, in, in helping raise awareness on ALICE, but many of our healthcare workers meet this ALICE 
definition and they are moms and single moms. Thank you, Sandy. Well, thank you, Sherry, and thank you for the work you and your 5,000 teammates do. You know, you're talking about an 80% female workforce. I run this tiny little business of 12 people and 80% of my employees are women and a number of them have children. But I've had the luxury of having this small business and there is the luxury to being a small business owner because you can make uh, very different kinds of decisions. Nobody's depending on us 24 seven, even a client in a crisis. So um, I have great empathy for what you and, and your HR people and your staff have to have to deal with. And I, I realize what a luxury um, my staff and I have had because we've been rem working remotely from day one and we're gonna continue to do it maybe forever. You can't do that. You've gotta be there so that uh, when I get sick and get to the hospital, there's somebody there who's gonna uh, take care of me. Um, well, Natalie, you know, uh, going back to you and the fact that you've been thinking about all of this for quite a long time and, and talking to a lot of people. And I mentioned before um, the Senator and gender, the gender pay gap uh, that, you know, Lily Ledbetter was part of a solution to. Um, what are, what are, what led us here? What's gotten us to this point in time other than, than COVID? Yeah, I, I, I love those con the, the questions that allow us to go back and think about what existed right before this, because one plus one equals this negative, this negative number that we're seeing of women that are being impacted. So it's really important just to touch upon what happened right before this. And right before COVID, women made up the majority of lower paid workers in this country. That's first and foremost. So again, we're taking a look at all women, but given the work that I do, I'm always applying that intersectional lens. And so first I'm gonna tell us about the equal pay day and what that pay gap looks like for women. So women basically worked all of 2020 and into the following spring to earn pay equivalent to male counterparts. And you could apply that to any year. However, when you approach this through an intersectional lens and we're looking at women of color or specifically black women like me, that's working all of 2020 and into August of 2021 to earn pay equivalent to male counterparts. And for Hispanic and indigenous women, or Latinx women, that's working all of 2020 and into October to earn pay equivalent to male counterparts. And so that is what existed prior to COVID. And so we're already seeing that there's tremendous disparity around how women are earning income. And it's also really important to note that one of the driving factors for lower wages for women have everything to do with motherhood and the intersection of that, of, of taking the level of care giving to the extreme. And so then what happens to those women who are now confined in the homes with children or don't have the luxury of staying home with with children or an inability to have those remote jobs, what happens there? But those, those, are the, those are the factors that persisted prior to COVID. So obviously if everyone is being impacted by COVID or, or the majority of us are being impacted by COVID in a very significant way, what happens to the individuals who are already being impacted in a very significant way? Thank you, Sandy. Well, it's interesting. Uh, one of my colleagues who, who's actually here with me today was telling me about a neighbor. Um, both parents are doctors. They've been working round the clock. They have a nine-year-old child who has been left at home as a latchkey kid. They couldn't find any childcare. And this little, I think it's a girl, but this child goes and knocks on doors and um, everybody in the neighborhood has sort of adopted the kid and realizes that you know, there, but for the grace of God, go they actually. So, um, you know, people at every level are really, uh, every working people at every level are really uh, being impacted, though, uh, certainly more seriously, uh, our Alice population. So, Franklin, uh, we've got this economic vulnerability, um, but what other ways do you see that United Way essentially? can come and, and really intervene and help with these various populations. Uh, thank you, Sandy. And I really appreciate Natalie's comments as well as Sherry's. Uh, this has been rich so far. Uh, when, you know, when our 
think about when our local hospitality and tourism industries, which employ so many here, as well as retailers, uh, restaurants and, and salons, you know, they shut down during the pandemic, women were disproportionately impacted, right? So when schools and, and daycare centers closed, so many women had to had no choice. You know, they had to stop working to care for their children and to help them with online classes and of course their homework. So our 201 Maryland helpline, which is free and confidential, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is one of our biggest barometers of need in our region, right? And I think the best way to sum up what United Way is seeing every day, as well as taking action on it, is to tell you about these actual calls, which have absolutely skyrocketed since the start of the pandemic. We're getting calls from women who were looking for a food pantry for the very first time in their lives, right? Amazing, from, from women who lost their jobs or had their hours slashed back with COVID closures. With a paycheck, without a paycheck, reduced paycheck, they can't pay their rent or mortgage and are facing eviction or foreclosure. We had a call from one mom who was selling her belongings and her kids' toys and clothes just to try to make rent. We had calls from women whose unemployment insurance ran out when jobs uh, did reopen, but they couldn't go back to work. Schools were still closed and they couldn't leave their children home alone, of course. There were calls from women who had COVID concerns for themselves and their families as well, who were sick and didn't have health insurance or whose daycare had closed and they had no one to actually take care of their children while they continued to work in essential in-person jobs. In fact, one of our call specialists at 211 was taking care of a young student from October to May because both parents are essential workers. And the aunt, who would typically care for him while the parents work, had moved out of state. So we get calls from people seeking housing, uh, food, and utility assistance, and several other critical uh, services. But there has been a huge spike since the pandemic. We've always assisted callers seeking housing, food and utility assistance and other critical service. That has always been the case, but it's been a huge spike since the pandemic. That is very, very clear to all of us. In fact, we saw over the past year, over 206,000 calls when normally it's around 100,000 calls. So an incredible influx during the pandemic. Well, I don't know how many people uh, who are listening today are really aware of the 211 helpline, 211 helpline. It is an extraordinary service. And uh, hats off to the people who are answering those calls and not just answering the calls, but providing real tangible information to the caller to help them solve whatever their problem is. So. Um, it's just an, another important aspect of, of what United Way is, is doing. Um, Sherry, you might have something, the equivalent of 211 in, in your hospital system. I don't know, but what, what do you see? We were talking about these barriers. What are the key barriers that you've seen where women have had to drop out of your workforce, stay at home, and then uh, you know, complicate the life of what goes on in the hospital system? Well, it, again, Sandy, it's very, very consistent with what Franklin and Natalie have described. And I do also want to applaud the 211 helpline. Uh, what, a, what a resource for us. That, it, you know, I'll, I'll describe this through the story of a colleague. I'll, I'll call her Sharon. Um, to, to make ends meet, Sharon works a weekday job and a second weekend job. She, like many that we've spoken of here, has a school-age child a spouse very sick with COVID who lost his job and income. And through the pandemic, she had some grandparent help with child care, but then that got reduced because of the risk of COVID, because of her job and because of her sick spouses. And in one of her jobs, she has a long and complicated commute relying on public transportation. This is not an unusual story. So the, the, when we think about these stories, how do we structurally fix this? Um, Franklin's mentioned you know, many uh, of our teammates, they don't have the opportunity to work remotely. And then what we think about what happens after the day job, you know, we used to say that women worked two shifts. Now, some of this language is women work 
four shifts. We worked the day job, the family caregiving job, the emotional labor of managing the well being of the family, and now all the management of the complexity of school. And it's very challenging if a child now who maybe is back in school also then requires quarantine. So what we've seen is increased resignations, shifts to positions outside of healthcare because there's much less risk and maybe some opportunity for, for remote. For some teammates, we've seen a very significant reduction in their work hours where they've made a choice to maybe they worked 40 hours a week, but they're gonna work now 20 hours a week. So then that um, has long-term implications, not only for our provision of service, but for their careers. And then we've seen um, many folks move to contracted employment without benefits, with also significant impact um, uh, from a variety of perspectives. What we're, we're understanding is there are jobs with less demand, of course, than in healthcare and the inherent risk and on-site nature. And we've also seen um, early retirements of many baby boomers who have just said, okay, this is um, you know, what's been called either the she session or the great resignation that um, we're, we're going to move out of the workforce. And, and I would, um, consistent with everything we've discussed, say that childcare and this classic sandwich generation is um, an affordable childcare is one of our most pressing needs. Well, listening to you and, and thinking about this enormous shift uh, in every part of our lives um, as a result of this pandemic is just, um, it's, it's unsettling at best. And Sherry, you're right. I mean, I, I'm thinking back to when my kids were growing up, I was a working mother. I had no family in, in town, but luckily it was at a time when a lot of women didn't work. I would never have been able to be a working mother if I didn't have non-working friends, quite frankly, who could pitch in and help me um, with my kids. And then I didn't have the technology issues that these women are facing and the school closings. And uh, these complexities, uh, this is really complex childcare. It's not, um, it's not your grandmother's childcare that uh, used to be what we dealt with. Um, I, I read recently in the Washington Post, which blew my mind, that full-time care for a child under five typically costs more than in-state college tuition. I mean, that is, that's extraordinary to me. And, and obviously, you know, child care remains really a, a seminal issue with all women um, during this very difficult time. I know that United Way is dealing with that problem. Um, and you can't take care of everybody's kids, but you can help take care of some. And uh, I'd like to have you show you a, a, a video of um, what's happening at a child care center that United Way has done in, in Howard County. We're so excited to be here on this site to break ground for our third United Way Family Center. At United Way, we provide what's needed where it's needed. Our United Way neighborhood zones are operating currently in Brooklyn and about Baltimore, as well as Poppleton and West Baltimore. And this will be our third installation here in Columbia, Maryland. We're excited because of the need that we're able to service. In Columbia, Maryland, there are so many individuals who have no ability to provide affordable, safe, quality childcare for the youngsters. In Howard County, many of our residents can use up to 20% of their income for child care, which is twice the national average of about 10%. There's a great need for affordable child care, especially in the early ages. Transportation is not accessible by many of the residents that live here in our county. For um, impoverished families that don't have a car, this family center is on a bus route. So this will provide that level of access that parents so definitely need in order for them to seek work, get work, and maintain work. Uh, the United Way Central Maryland Family Center uh, in Howard County was incredibly important for our hospital. Uh, 
When we look at reliable and affordable childcare, it's probably one of the most important factors in engaging our staff. And we feel if they have reliable childcare, um, then that provides stability in the family, which translates into increased productivity and engagement at the workplace. When we think about what's happening here, we love the effort that United Way has undertaken here in Howard County with the Family Center. Um, I think it's going to be a real you know, win-win for both employers and employees. With the program being developed here, it should give these kids a great a start um, you know, before they actually enter into their more formal education in the years to come. When you are faced with the choices that you have to make around where to keep your children safe while you go out to make a living so that you can actually keep a roof over their heads and keep them clothed and fed, um, those tensions, those stressors increase. We're thrilled to be a part of this project, acting as developer and donating the land and uh, managing the construction process. It's uh, a key component of our corporate responsibility. We always give back to the communities where we live, where we work, where we own property. Our corporate headquarters is right around the corner here, so this project takes on added significance for us. I know it's drizzling and I know it's cloudy, but trust me, right here the sun is shining because any time we can bring necessary, needed, and deeply wanted services to this community, it is a bright day. Well, Franklin, we're, we're thrilled that you and your colleagues are hard at work at doing this. And um, one of the speakers mentioned transportation. And I, I was uh, told yesterday about a demographer who gave a report to one of the local foundations and was speaking uh, to the issue of transportation and that it represents one of the most difficult issues uh, that we have in, in the city and the surrounding counties. And that it, it again, it, like childcare is one of those things that's gotta be attended to in order to bring equity and opportunity to, uh, to the people we're talking about. But as we talk about childcare, I wanna do another poll. What do, you, what do you think, how much do you think childcare cost monthly in this region? Well, we've, we've got some knowledgeable people, I think, uh, <laughs> who are answering this question. Let me, let me punt to Franklin. Franklin, what is, what is the answer uh, of the cost for uh, two children per month for child care in our state? So in Maryland, according to our Alice report, Sandy, the average cost for a parent with two children in child care is $1,300 a month, right? So to put this in context, the cost of housing averages $1,500 a month. So in Baltimore City and each of the Central Maryland counties that we serve, child care, yes, child care is the second biggest family expense after rent or mortgage. So we know that low income households, we know this through the data and single parent families in particular, they struggle to afford quality child care and they often pay a higher portion of their actual income for child care. So compounding the cost issue, is the fact that low paid child workers fall in the Alice category too. So the cost and availability of someone said in the chat of quality childcare is a concern across our region and the country as well. And so as you know, we recently conducted a statewide COVID impact survey. And so one of the findings that stood out was that those in the Alice category were twice as worried about childcare than other parents. So let me tell all of you, that was absolutely no surprise to us here at United Way. The video you just saw gave an overview of our Columbia Family Center where parents who are at or below the Alice threshold can actually enroll their children at a reduced rate, which is just one way that we break down barriers for low-income, hardworking families. We are supporting not only the education and the growth of the children in these centers, but also parents and other family members as well. So our family centers are about creating really what we like to call long-term change for children, for families, and yes, for the community because stronger families ultimately means stronger neighborhoods. And that's really the truth.
Well, I think uh, certainly everybody uh, listening today supports, heartily supports what you're doing and, and looks forward to your rolling out even more. And I'm, I'm thinking about Sherry's um, team members and all the shift workers who then have to look for childcare. And that, that's even more complicated and causes additional stresses. So uh, Natalie, beyond childcare, talk to us about these other layers of, of stress and anxiety that you see are, are really uh, impacting the, the Alice working woman. So I want to I want to focus specifically on the digital divide, and so all of a sudden COVID hits, and we're inundated with these messages to stay home. But who has the luxury of being able to stay home, and what is that quality of home life like? And there's a Pew Research study circulating that states that Black and Brown people have the smallest percentage of access to computers and tablets. So all of a sudden we have a core group of individuals who aren't even eligible for access to that opportunity for remote work. And at no surprise, and you can see we're teasing out a theme here that having that lower income that makes that type of tech inaccessible fits perfectly in line with the Alice data as we are seeing that black and brown populations are more significantly impacted nationally and then also regionally in the ALICE data. So with the digital divide, what happens during COVID, peak COVID when your children are or need to be in the home? What happens when you don't have access to remote work and you have to take public transportation? Because we spoke about transportation a little bit in the last segment, Black and brown populations also have the smallest percentage of access to cars. And so if you're relying on public transportation, if that's even accessible, thinking about the time outside of the household to get there and the time once you get on that public transportation, it takes as it continues to make all those stops in between before you get to your destination. And so what happens when you have smaller children? Who's caring for those children? And what happens when you are involved in work that doesn't offer a wage that will allow you to pay for these exorbitant, childcare is basically like a mortgage. It's, it's a mortgage payment per child. And so when you take, when you apply the digital divide to that, it, I, I work with a lot of school systems. And so I'm hearing firsthand from school systems that they're definitely seeing that children of color are disproportionately impacted by the digital divide. And it has a lot to do with an inability to access quality care, especially for moms during this time. So it's, it's a really, it's, as we're hearing from the other panelists that we're not even gonna be able to grasp the magnitude of what this issue fully entails in this hour that we have allotted, but I'm learning a great deal. And as we tease out certain areas, we're realizing there's so much that we're not even gonna be able to discuss. And so I do feel that at some point we need some measures that are going to the next level to begin to reconcile the magnitude of, of this entire problem. Well, you know, we've heard so much about equity uh, over the last year, and now the, this intersection of equity and economic freedom and ability, and, and I'm thinking that we also should add empathy. I think all of us really need to think about the emotions uh, that are festering with all of these women who face these just enormous obstacles. But there are solutions. There's a, I, I always like to tell my kids there's a solution to every problem. I don't think they always agree with me, but that's sort of my mantra. And um, Sherry, you, you've got lots of issues to solve. Um, how, how are you addressing some of these? Because of all of us, you're the one that is directly intersecting and, and working with a very uh, large population of, of working women. Well, Sandy, I, again, I, I think that the, we will, we will ponder what was longstanding, but also optimistically use the time of the pandemic to catapult us. And I think about you know, this session we're having here 
that's creating awareness and action. I mean, think it, it just the, you know, it, it made me smile to see the video of the daycare center and to understand the awareness that comes with a deeper understanding of Alice. You know, I, I think also I'm, I'm always surprised when I communicate to folks that 80% of our workforce is women and, and they, they don't know that. And the range of positions that exist. What I think about a lot, and you used empathy, we talk about um, through the crisis, empathy and a plan. So it's not to have enough to have a plan that doesn't have empathy. Um, but we, we, can't have, we, we can't have the reverse. So early on, we were managing crisis and, and offered crisis-based things and continue to do that. Um, hotel options for folks who are worried about transmissibility or food support or financial bridges and lots and lots to Natalie's point about the digital divide, lots and lots of support around um, managing through the pandemic, what it meant to manage that. But now we do kind of optimistically have to catapult and innovate to real sustainable changes. I think you know across our industry and across our partner industries, uh, employee assistance programs, continued financial bridges, tuition assistance, scholarships, true career development. One thing that's very important in our system is something we call the heart force recommendations. And that stands for Health Equity and Anti-Racism Task Force. And, and the a big uh, focus for us there is to, to hire and retain a diverse workforce and build career paths and get behind many of these structural barriers to that career development. Fundamental to this, of course, um, although it, it only addresses part of the issue, but fundamental is um, appropriate compensation and benefits. We as a health system implemented a $15 minimum wage a few years ago, and we will continue to escalate that. And then we know that that, that is, is still a factor that would contribute to Alice. I mean, we have to get beyond that and get beyond other, um, other items. I think we all know from this discussion that flexible scheduling in a 24 seven operation is key, but we must maintain a 24 seven operation. And so there are ideas for creative scheduling, including um, a, a historically used one that we're um, implementing again to some degree is called a weekend alternative option where to manage life and, and family, um, we have in a limited way, some ability to work all weekends, but have weekdays off. And you get some um, pay uh, increase with that, but and full benefits. So there's, it's an expensive program, but one of those structural changes that we can think about that add more flexibility. So uh, I, I guess I would end with um, saying that we, um, we gotta go big. We got to use this to innovate and go big. And I'm reminded of the United Nations panel on women that described a handful of R's and then it's been expanded to five R's. We got to recognize unpaid work, reduce care work systematically through infrastructure, things like transportation, redistribute. I think this is a very interesting. We, when we talk about redistributing work, we often talk about it as redistributing it between men and women, but it's also redistributing between society and the family. How through things like better childcare, more societally can we redistribute care? We need to represent at every level on this topic and make sure women are at the table. And thank you, um, Senator, if, uh, if you're with us for representing so well and then certainly reward the work in every way possible and the unpaid work, so. And I think hearing from you just reminds all of us that uh, this is a societal issue, it's a communal issue, and that we are all affected by those things that affect these women. If a nurse can't be at, come into uh, the hospital, if a childcare worker can't be 
where she's needed. That affects all of us. So um, again, I think those, those five R's are a good reminder to us of how interconnected we all are. Uh, you know, Natalie, I, I know that um, you've got this historic knowledge of inequities and um, you've thought about this a lot, but I'd like to hear from you also about solutions because we need to we need to have a positive path forward. I think we all need to get off this call today saying, you know, we're gonna do something and there are thing, real things that we can in fact do. I think you're on mute. There we go. So when I do my facilitations, I always invite everyone to identify three ways they could become more culturally responsive. So I love your idea of empathy and a plan because that is what's required. We need to feel and then we need to act. We can't just sit there and feel these types of things and, and not come together to, to mitigate and reconcile. And just yesterday on the subject of solutions, I actually saw a tweet from Governor Hogan, which says, child care providers have played a critical role in Maryland's recovery efforts. We are distributing an additional 155 million for licensed child care providers to help address the financial burdens and operational challenges faced during the pandemic. So there are things that we can do on our level, but it does require systemic, legislation and to an overhaul in order for us to really move the needle. But for everyone here in this space today, there are there are things that we could do. And I think that educating yourself, carving time out of your day to come and listen to a group of individuals talk about how they are understanding what's impacting women is a great way to arm yourself with an understanding of what is needed to begin to make change. On October 21st, we are partnering with United Way for a factuality facilitation, which allows participants to simulate some of what we discussed today, which naturally creates feelings of empathy. And then at the end, we'll all come together to begin to identify what a plan could be. And so while it does seem daunting and we didn't even cover, we only covered a tiny amount of what is truly impacting women, that we could at least come together and walk away with carving out or creating or identifying our own solutions as well too. Well, Sandy. because I'm in PR and I always like Sandy. to put a positive spin on everything, let me say that um, maybe some good will come out of COVID. Maybe some learnings and uh, some institutional changes that uh, should have happened a long time ago, but, but are now happening as a result of, um, of this pandemic. So Franklin, um, I know that again, you're there on the ground with the United Way forces and funding. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the solutions that you think are possible. Before I talk about solutions, Sandy, I think Senator Mikulski wanted to make a comment. If we could take her off of mute, uh, our host, and let her make her comment, then I will certainly wrap up with what we're doing. Uh, in the solution space. Senator Mikulski, if you can say a few words, please go right ahead. Yes, first of all, thank you, Franklin, and thank you, United Way, for this really robust and content-rich uh, uh, conversation today. First of all, no matter how good private philanthropy is, it can never be a substitute for public policy. Private philanthropy is to be in addition to public policy, not a substitute for. And that brings me to the Biden plan, not to be uh, political about Joe Biden, but to talk about to talk about the fact that the Biden plan, and I wonder what the panel thinks, um, that the Biden plan related to infrastructure to bring broadband to do child care, along with this reconciliation package. Do we does the do you all even know about it? And would this be a big step forward so that state and local governments would have the resources that they need to meet these compelling human needs that have been outlined? You see what I'm saying? We have a public policy solution that's out there now being debated, ready for votes. And I wonder how those here today think that meets the need. And though 
I know the United Way is not an advocacy arm and you're a 501c3. As individuals and heads of organizations, we could be advocating this. Well, Natalie, how about responding to what you've just heard from the Senator? And excuse the hair, I'm having a bad hair day. <laughs> what a great public policy day. It's all good. I, I think it looks wonderful, Senator. So I am familiar with, with what the current legislation or what we're trying to work towards. And it sounds like it's only going to be, I'm not terribly familiar, but it sounds like it's only going to be beneficial. And it's unfortunate though, that we do live in a society where some of us don't even see the value in the conversation that we're having today, let alone funds associated with and allocated to resolving a major, major issue nationwide. Well, I think well, the Senator brings up, Go ahead. I'm sorry, Senator. But I didn't understand the answer. Would the Biden plan be helpful and be Three. a major down payment on the solution to the really compelling issues discussed today? Absolutely. Especially the way you describe it. It seems like it could only it could only help. So why aren't we moving in that direction is, is the question. Well, and why aren't we pushing? Why aren't we pounding the table? Why aren't we really throwing over the tables to get broadband in Baltimore City to serve the black butterfly. Oh, yeah, yeah. We need to have a separate conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think the senator brings up a very important point that actually we all discussed um, amongst ourselves, and that is that this is cannot just be the province of the not-for-profit or philanthropic sector nor can it be just corporate America, but they need to push for this. But it is certainly key to government and, and public policy. And, and Sherry, I don't wanna put you in a position where you have to answer a political question, but a lot of your life revolves around public policy and, and state and federal mandates, am I correct? Yeah, you're you're absolutely correct, and I, I think that you know uh, Natalie's response and the senator uh, nails it. Um, there are many many elements in this plan that will advance us. And when I you know I commented about the the R's, one of those most important R's is policy making that can have this deep infrastructure impact and funds flow that maybe we truly can catapult out of this um, for a difference. And, uh, you know, um, I, I, I like the notion of uh, table banging on this topic that the Senator suggests. Well, somebody just wrote in whose initials are, uh, whose first name is Brenda. So I won't give your last name. And, and she asked in the chat, how can we do something? Well, one thing you can do is call 202-224-3121, which is the number for the Capitol, and let people who represent you know what you care about. And this was not supposed to be a, this is not a political statement. And Franklin, I'm not even gonna ask you to comment on all this because I don't want to get you knee no, deep in, right. in political conversation. But, uh, but the Senator certainly has brought up uh, an important issue uh, as it relates to public policy, but, if you want to end on a positive note, the fact of the matter is that we all have the ability to change and direct public policy and that we all have a responsibility to do that. But in Franklin's world, we also have a, a responsibility to volunteer and to help fund important things. So if you could just give us a little closing and I'm I'm going off script here. They asked me, you know, not to go rogue uh, during this one hour conversation. So I've been pretty good about following the script, but, but Franklin, talk to us a little bit about uh, the, the part of the population that really may want to, people on the call today who may want to volunteer, how important volunteerism is to making these things happen for the women that we care about, how much, how important funding is philanthropic funding. Well, thank you so very much. All the comments, Senator, uh, thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Sherry. Um, at United Way, we're touching all of these things we discussed, right? Digital divide, all the pieces around transportation, 
Um, and we, we really put a stake in the ground on affordable, accessible childcare, you know, which is so critical uh, to the success of working women um, and also families across our region. So we, we are working hard to provide economic advancement opportunities, you know, like our certified nursing assistant and geriatric nursing assistant training programs, which are outstanding. They really prepare people, a majority of whom are women, um, and heads of their household for a job with great potential for advancement and one that will actually pay the bills, right? Which is so important. We help prevent evictions. Uh, we rapidly rehouse families who have lost their homes through, in many cases, no fault of their own. We provide healthy food to those in need. You know, we're installing, uh, Natalie, Wi-Fi hotspots in underserved neighborhoods uh, that people have free digital access, which is a necessity, of course, these days, and computers to students and families, right? So that kids won't fall behind in school. And of course, so that moms and dads can actually access job opportunities, their work schedules and all the services and all the resources that we rely on all of us every day. I like to also say that a majority of United Way's employees are women, including a number of working mothers, right? So we pivoted our office operations to 100% remote and we're highly attuned to and respond to the new work-life challenges that the pandemic has imposed on all of our team members. So we encourage flexible work schedules because we really know what they're facing. And we are all about supporting our team who really, honestly, they make our good work possible, right? So for our teams who are out of the community providing direct service and doing a lot to support our families and individuals, we honestly had to quickly find a way to make that work. And so we stepped up so that all the aid and resources that we provide was not interrupted. And in fact, it increased dramatically, honestly. Uh, these efforts, you know, Sandy, continue and will keep working uh, to make sure people can recover and rebuild from the impact of the pandemic. That's really, really on our minds. And we do all of this and much, much more every single day. But we can't do any of this without our partners. So other nonprofits, community leaders, you know, supporters, volunteers, they actually make our work possible every day. And it truly takes a united front to achieve meaningful and also measurable and lasting changes. So to improve the lives of working women in greater Baltimore, we all need to work closely together. Law and policymakers, corporations, nonprofits, community organizations, and individuals to create the meaningful, measurable, and lasting change that they deserve. And so we wanna do everything we can, Sandy, to encourage people to get involved in virtual and in-person volunteer opportunities, skills-based and otherwise. Call your legislative community, members, let them know what your passions are, and we want to make a difference. That's really what it's about for us. We want to make a difference in the short term as well as the long term. Make sure that your voice is heard because united, we can do it. So uh, thank you all very much for being with us today. If you want to get in touch with any of the panelists, um, here is their contact information. And if you, uh, if you are drawn to this issue passionately, we ask you to go to visit uwcm.org slash help a working mom. And if you wanna help America, help a working mom. Thank you very much for being with us today. Be well, stay safe. Well, thank you all for joining today's Realities of Inequity session. Before we close, we want to know what topics you'd like to hear about in future sessions. Please enter your comments in Slido. The link will be posted again in the chat and be sure to check your email for information on our upcoming sessions. Thank you everyone and have a great afternoon. We'll leave the poll up for a few minutes so that you can give us your responses. Thank you. Hmm. Do I end this now?
Thank you again, everyone, for your responses to the poll. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day, all.